All right. We are now recording. So don't say anything you don't want recorded. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So we had asked Dr. Terry Bates and Nick Gunner to, from Orbitus, who are developers on the app, the MyEV tool, to kind of give a run through. Originally, we were going to be in person. And unfortunately, due to numbers, we're online. But for, to answer all of your questions, help you set up your farms on the app yourself. And with that, I'll let Terry and Nick take it away. All right. Share my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Someone needs to get rid of that photo. Yes, we can. <laughs> that, is that the, that's the one shred of personal identity that I must not have removed from the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to start with, uh, uh, let's see. I was going to start with this slide just because it is hokey. <laughs> uh, you know, okay. So today, thanks everyone for being here. Um, and we've, we, the, the team, the efficient vineyard team and, and, the heavy work from Nick Gunner have developed a spatial data visualization tool. It's essentially at its core is to be able to collect spatial data in the field and be able to visualize it, and then eventually be able to make management decisions and variable rate management practices in the field. Um, so I've given several seminars on the Efficient Vineyard Project over the last couple of years and in precision viticulture using spatial data in vineyards has, it's created a huge buzz. And, you know, I mean, there are titles like, you know, what's the promise of precision viticulture and how is spatial data going to save the industry? And, and to me, really, precision viticulture is just a tool, right? The, what we're trying to present to you and provide to you is um, a tool that you can use to do what we already know how to do, right? Maximize light interception, minimize internal canopy shading, which is all about optimizing vine size in the vineyard, which has to do with water and nutrient management. I mean, these are things that we've been talking about for decades. Uh, you know, crop load management. How do we match the crop size, the growing season we have, and to the vine health that you have? And what happens if the vine is undercropped, balanced, and overcropped, right? These are all viticulture concepts that we know and we use, whether we use the right terms or not. I mean, that is the real, um, you know, that's, th that's the real thing behind quality and efficient and productive and profitable fruit production. Precision viticulture is just a tool to be able to capture what's going on spatially within the vineyard and be able to apply those concepts variable rate through the, the vineyard. So it's, you know, there's nothing better than a good blaster by your side. Um, so again, at its core, the my EV tool is really about being able to uh, establish your farm blocks and put spatial data into that and to be able to visualize that spatial data. So to visualize what the pattern is in the vineyard and be able to do something with it. So, so the platform, this is kind of what Nick and I have been working on in, in terms of you know, the going down the, the left-hand side is the what I call the spatial data pipeline, right? You need to establish your farm. Um, we've put recent effort into block level record keeping. So what we want to do is um, instead of just drawing the block, actually have annual data that goes into that block like okay what was the yield for the last three years and be able to kind of track what's going on at the block level where the spatial data is at the sub block level so establish your farm import spatial data and so the two things i want to show you today is how to import data from a sensor and then how to collect your own spatial data with a data collector and a cell phone um, and then be able to visualize that data. Uh, I'm not going to talk very much about data translation. I'm not going to talk at all about data translation today because that's part of the platform that we're continuing to work on. I will touch on data interpolation just a little bit at the end because it has a little bit more to do with the visualization. You're like, how to, you know, you get that raw data in there, the data is messy, um, and the data interpolation helps you smooth and look at that data so you, you get 
not just a pretty map, but a map that is showing you what the underlying pattern in the vineyard, and that's the pattern you're going to manage against. Uh, there's other things that the platform does, you know, multi-layer integration, and then we're working also on generating management maps, which we, we would then interface with our machines. I'm not really going to talk about any of that kind of higher level stuff. What I really want to do today is be able to walk you through establishing a farm, creating blocks, and then importing data and be able to look at that data. And if you could do that by the end of the day, you can spend the next couple of weeks playing with it, um, breaking it, coming up with questions, and then we can come back and try to answer some of those questions. So all I was really gonna do is just walk you through how you do this. Um, you know, the first thing you do, <laughs> go to the website, uh, efficientvineyard.com. You know, you're probably gonna, it's gonna jump you to the homepage. It'll look something like that. Uh, we have, under this VIT blog setting, we have several, um, you know, articles. How do we use spatial data? This, there's one, the first one you see here is variable rate fruit thinning for Concord. So, you know, big issue this year was uh, we set a very big crop, bigger than what our vines could ripen, which delayed fruit maturation. And so like a lot of people were harvesting very late. You know, we use that spatial data not only to do crop estimation, but then do variable rate thinning in our vineyards. And, and then we look at, you know, how much earlier was the fruit um, in the vines where we thinned than where we, where we didn't thin. Um, and there's a bunch of tutorial videos on there on how to use the MyEV platform from establishing a vineyard right up to like doing, you know, raster data analysis. There's a, everything that's out there. So you can work your way through those tutorial videos um, when you're trying to use my email. Um, okay, so you get to the website, there's information out there on how to use it, and you go to this big red button in the corner called the My EV Tool, and it jumps you to a page where you can put it and make your own account or log into your account. So let me log into my account. Terry, I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Yeah. How do you want people to ask questions during this? Do you just want them to unmute? Do you want them to put it in the chat box and then I'll interrupt? Whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So whatever they're comfortable with. If I don't care if people just want to interrupt or if you feel more comfortable sending it to Jen and then she has no problem interrupting me. I have no problem interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys want to um, open up on your computer, if you're on your phone or whatever, and kind of do this at the same time and see if you run into issues. Right. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I uh, I logged in, put in my password, and boom, it jumps to my account. So everything is, all the information is stored up in the cloud. Um, so whether you're using this on your desktop or if you're using it on, on your cell phone, uh, it I mean, all the information's there for you. Um, so a little bit of an anatomy of how things are laid out. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a couple buttons. You know, one's uh, notifications. One is if you want to give any feedback um, to Nick or myself if you encounter a bug and or or you're like, oh, I was out in the field and I was trying to do this. I really wish it did X, Y, or Z. Put that in the feedback button and, and we'll try to address it. Um, and then your user settings down here. So all the information down here is, it's about you and your account, right? So communication, um, your different farms, and we're gonna walk through that in a second. Uh, up at the top left-hand corner is the information about the farm that you're working on. So you can have different farms. And so the, the button at the top will tell you what farm, I'm working on the Clarel, Clarel data share farm at the moment. Um, so everything about that farm, the data layers, and then the tools that you can use to work with the data on that farm or in that upper corner. The upper right-hand side, there's some navigation buttons that are kind of self-explanatory. And then the lower right-hand corner is the data collector, which we'll, I'll talk about later on. Uh, okay, so let's go down and talk about you. <laughs> if you set up an account, I go to my account, TRB7. Right, I can look at what my what farms I have, um, my user settings, and I can log out. Like if you're on a computer, shared computer, and you don't want somebody jumping on your my EV account, 
Um, but I click on my farm. So here are all the farms at this point that I'm associated with, either farms that I have created or farms people have shared with me uh, that they said it's okay for me to look at their, their data. Um, so the one we use a lot here at the lab is the Clara, Clara data share. So that's something that, that Rianne and I and Nick Gunner share data from uh, when things are collected in the field. So, so you know, Rianne can take data off of a sensor, load it up into the data share farm, and then I can look at it, manipulate it. Um, and I did make one, my EV demonstration farm, in case everything screws up, I can show you what I've already done there. But le let's create, we're gonna create a farm today, um, a new farm, just as you would if you did it. So I just go to this new farm. So I wanna create a farm and let's call it the best farm ever. That's gonna be your farm. <laughs> Um, okay, now this is uh, something new that we've added and it's about block level data recording. And I think we, Nick and I need to talk about this. I think we should change this where it says block fields because it's a little confusing. It's not, <laughs> it's not a physical field. What we're saying is it's more like block attributes. When I want to create my blocks, I wanna put in certain data about those blocks like you know, what variety it is, what year was planted, uh, what rootstock is it on. So I can, so anytime I create a block, I can put that data in and it'll, you can then download that data and keep a record of it. Um, so for example, I just wanna add a block field. I wanna say uh, year planted. It's a text, so I add that field. I wanna add another one for variety. Maybe one about rootstock or spacing, whatever you want to add there. Uh, what I would really like to do now, this is future down the road, is to say if I put in my crop estimation. So if I had a field or an attribute of 2021 crop estimation, 2022 crop estimation, 2023 crop estimation, and then maybe final yield for that block. Um, that could potentially, if like we had enough people in the industry using it, we could funnel that data, compile it and have from a, a regional standpoint, have a better idea of what crop estimation was. I think there's some political things to work out there. I'm just working on it from the technology side. Okay. Mary, yes. We did have one question come through and that yep. is, can I upload existing maps from crop insurance data? Uh, maybe Nick can answer that question. It, it probably depends on how they come in. If they are shape files. Yeah. Yeah. So it just depends on the type of, um, data that you have. We're trying to support as many forms of GIS data as possible right now, GeoJSON, we take CSV shape files, um, and we're working on GeoTIFF as well. We have a really rudimentary raster. Um, acceptance as well. Yeah. And when you create blocks, you have the option of uploading a zipped shape file. So for example, <laughs> I actually didn't draw these blocks. Rianne drew the blocks for me in ArcGIS. She saved those shape files as a zipped um, shape, a zipped shape file folder or whatever. And then that uploaded right into my EV and it projected those blocks. And now I can add data to those blocks. Um, okay, so we got the best farm ever. The blocks, I'm gonna have you know years planted, what the variety is, what rootstock is, or whatever else I wanna put in there. I save that. Oh, I gotta select a location on the map by asking you know, where the farm is. And so I'm just gonna hover over the Claro building and I'll click it. Oh, I gotta hit okay. Okay, there's the location of the farm, hit save. Hopefully it all works. Hey, all right. I, yes. Um, can that, a little bit of a tangential question, but once you have that data in there, so that's the kind of stuff we use, we put exactly the, those fields that you would just put in for the blocks. It's what we use in our GIS maps, just for the vineyards and the Finger Lakes. Yeah. Is it easy enough to export that to something else? 
Nick, that's another question for you. <laughs> yeah, um, the intention is for your blocks to be created at, um, to be treated as a data set. So right now, when you create a data set or you import a data set of field data, you can then export that data and re-import it. Um, you can visualize your map based on it. So we want to do all of that stuff with um, your farm level block data. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So we have our new best farm ever. I have no, I have not drawn any blocks around on this new farm yet. So I'll zoom in to a couple of these blocks. So now I go to the information on, on, on my farm. So I hit my best farm ever, got my farm settings, collaborate. If I want to invite any collaborators, so I can, uh, if I want Nick to be on this or I want Hans to be able to see this, I can enter Hans's email. I can invite him as either an administrator where they have full control over everything or just as an editor where they can, they can see, but they can't really do any manipulation with the data. And okay, so I want to create a block, uh, block name. So I'm going to, so these two one acre blocks that we have, are we call them Martin East and Martin West. So we'll go Martin East is was planted, I think in 2015, Concord and it's own rooted. And if I had a GIS file that already had those blocks um, designated on there, I could upload that, that zipped Shape file and it would just project those on there, but we're going to draw them. Let's either draw the block. So, so when I'm stupid and I don't actually do what I, it wants me to do, it tells me what it wants me to do. So it helps guide you through. Okay, so I have to draw one of these blocks. I go over to the tool, this little square box tool, and I grab that polygon tool and I just click around this block. So you're clicking on every point Just on, on every corner and then you can go in and grab like you can dissect that line in half and then if i say i wanted to move that line i can do that hit that square box again to complete so now there's the block there's martin east when it was planted the information i have and hit submit Sometimes this takes a little bit of time to recompile. Okay, now there's one of my blocks. I want to add a second block. The block. We're going to call it Martin West. Okay, same thing, deal. Go over, grab that block. And it might not be perfect, but there it is. I hit submit, and those are the only two that I'll draw for right now. So I can click now on one of these blocks, and it tells me what's the acreage and then the information I had put in there before. So, you know, you start now, and then you just keep building that information on there. Um, you can always go in and edit your block settings. So I think if so you have to go back out to your farm and your farm settings if you want to add more fields. So like, say you wanted to do, what was the yield in 2019, 2020, 2022, 21, whatever. <laughs> uh, you would have to add those fields and then you can go in and keep adding data to that. I, I just wanted to jump in real quick um, and mention that in those fields, you won't have to eventually um, create a new field for each year if you wanted to collect data every year. Um, we're working on some uh, more dynamic types of fields that basically let you enter a log in. Um, so you could just use the same field once per year and enter that same kind of data and it would keep that log uh, rather than having to have a new field because it would eventually get really long. You'd have a a ton of fields for each year, so. 
Does anybody have any questions up to this point? So Nick, do you mean basically you'd, you'd have like almost like a mini table that says, you know, yield in 2015, 2016, 2017, and it would just read? Yeah. Is that so, kind of what you mean? Yeah, I'm thinking of um, basically a logger field or we haven't quite figured out exactly what to name it yet, but, um, and these would be available in the collectors as well. Um, so basically you could, whenever you wanted to go in and log a new value. So if you were measuring, you know, yield for the block, you could log in once per year and just log that yield as it's harvested. And so it might be a little bit of a different date each year, but then you could in the future um, scope out uh, how that value changed year to year. Right. Okay. Okay, so now we want to add spatial data to these blocks or to one of the blocks. Um, okay, so pardon me. Somebody say something. Okay, thought I heard somebody say something. I thought I heard something too, but I think it may. Have just uh, okay, so okay, here's one very common scenario. You call up Jen Russo at the lab and you say, "Hey, I'm kind of interested in this stuff, but I don't have any sensors. Can you know? Can you send Scott out?" and scan a couple of vineyards for me so I can, you know, see what this stuff's all about. And so we send out Scott or Ian or somebody from the lab, goes out with an NDVI sensor, scans your field, comes back, and then emails you a file. And you're like, what the heck do I do with this thing? Um, so we want to add um, data. So this little thing that looks like I don't know what that is supposed to look like coins or data layers. <laughs> that's a that's a server. A server. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna go to a server and you're gonna get get your data. Um, okay, so I want to upload data, and I'm gonna just call this Cornell NDVI scan because uh, Scott came out, scanned your vineyard, and gave it to Rianne and she made sure the data looked good. And then she emailed you a file. Um, it went to your email and you put it in a folder that you're using for this, this work. So you go to your computer and you choose the file that you downloaded from your email. So it, in my case, I have an efficient vineyards project folder, 2021 data, my EV demo. Um, and I'm looking for the file. So I hit this all files here. I have two files in there. One is an NDVI scan that was taken on July 13th. Um, and we're going to talk about this other raw data file later. But later. Um, so I just click on that. I Sir, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So if somebody did call me and we came out and scanned, and if they made either Rian or yourself or myself a collaborator, could we potentially upload that data? Yes, absolutely. If they, if they have their farm and their farm blocks, yep. And you could get in there and like act as the administrator, then you could also upload that data. Okay, thanks. So, so yeah, okay. So say someone emailed you a file that was named NDVI scan 713-2021. You click on that, it processes the data. If there's some kind of error at this point, it's all just gonna shut down and not work for you. But in this case, it does work great. <laughs> uh, and you have all, okay, so here's all the data that came in. So this. These are the rows that Scott say came out and scanned for you. Um, we got to hit submit to submit the data. Okay, now you can visualize that raw data. So um, if you hit value based, so you want to color these data points essentially, and you hit value based and you come up with all these different little green boxes with weird little acronyms in there. So let me show you what the data file actually looks like. So if I opened up that same file that you just uploaded, if I open that up in Excel, it looks something like this, where it's got all this data about the GPS location um, as, if, you know, and there's a lot of data there, right? Because that NDVI sensor is collecting data every second. There's two sensors pointing at either side of the canopy. So it's collecting all this data and it's location information. But what you're interested in is the headers that are up here. So a lot of this just has to do with the GPS um, and the time you took it. 
And then it's what the sensor is actually reading. So there are different vegetative indices, NDRE, which is the normalized difference red edge, NDVI, which is the one that we're typically interested in, red edge, near infrared, red. So it has all these headers. So you have to know which one you want to look at. <laughs> and just to make things easy, we'll just, we're always looking at NDVI, which is the normalized difference vegetative index. And that just means the sensor is looking at your canopy and it's looking at green tissue. If there's a nice healthy green tissue there, you get a nice strong signal. If there's a dead vine and the leaves are all dead, you're gonna get a really low signal. Um, so that's what we're looking for when we're going through the vineyard. And those are the same headers now that you're gonna see in my EV. So we wanna color this data and we wanna color it by NDVI. So I click on the NDVI button and it all comes up green and you're like, well, my uniform, my vineyard's totally uniform and I don't know why they bothered to come out and scan. And that's not necessarily true. When you look at sensor data, whether it comes from a, a soil sled or a drone or even a satellite image, there is a lot of, I would say, junk data in there. Um, the, there's like when he's traveling down the farm roads, it's giving you weird data. If um, there's a weird electrical pulse in the sensor, it's going to give you a weird data. So you have to kind of filter out all that junk data to get the good data that you really want to see. And so Nick built in these filters, which, so there's, I want, how do I say this? Ryan is in the office next to me. It can be pretty complicated to run through the actual spatial data processing to get good data. And that's what Rianne is so good at doing. Um, and we were like, how, how am I gonna do it? How are you gonna do it? Um, in a kind of an easy, intuitive way so that you can look at the data that you want. So we added these slider filters in. So I put a filter on it. I, again, I'm filtering on NDVI values. And I know NDVI is a measurement that goes from zero to one. And you can see that the values go from minus 545 to 622, which is garbage. Um, so I set this, let's set this one at zero and this is one at one because I know NDVI is a measurement from zero to one and hit trim data. So now I'm like, whoa, okay. When we collect sensor data in a biological system, we tend to get data in a bell-shaped curve. So that's what I'm looking for in, in my data. It's a nice like bell-shaped curve that shows me that there's some natural variation going on in the vineyard. So I can move these sliders now and start omitting junk data like on the headlands and the farm roads. And, and you can see as I start moving this slider, more and more of the red starts to show up in the field. So I get to a point where I'm like, is that real data? Do I, those low NDVI values in the middle of the field are probably starting to get real. Like I have missing vines or weak vines and I wanna capture that, those weak vines as part of my analysis. So I you know, intuitively find a spot that I like, trim the data. And now it's again, cutting out more and more of the junk data I got this tail at the top end, again, some high values that's probably junk until I start moving into my fields again and something where I think it's reasonable and hit trim data. So now this is the data I want to, I want to really want to work with. So now we're just at a point where Harry, you're stuck. Sorry. Yeah. So as you were moving those sliders, all those red dots were the ones that were going to get trimmed out? Yes. You're doing, okay, got it. Yeah, so now the only data that is showing is uh, NDVI value from 0.64 to 0.94. So, and then you can, you know, you can, to your heart's desire, you can, if you don't like yellow and green, you can make a whatever color you want. You can make them red and blue and you can just mess around. So in this case, it's ramping that color linear. So it's got a linear response from red to blue. And that's kind of why you see those different colors in there. You can 
do different. So the, again, this is more spatial data stuff. You can split that data on equal intervals with different zones or a jinx is where it's cutting off different zones, kind of looking at the spread in the data. It's, we're getting it way too, you can just play with these until you find something that looks good to you <laughs> or looks reasonable to what's going on in the field. Again, when you're looking at raw data, it's just as good to um, just to look at, let's go back to that. What was it, yellow and green? Um, it's just as good to look at a linear ramp just to kind of see what's going on. So you can kind of see it's a little bit more yellow in this area and a little bit more dark green in this area um, to show differences in the vineyard. Uh, okay, let's do one more thing before I switch over to the, the, da the data collector. So again, I'm, we're just looking at raw data. We're not actually processing the data so much at this point. Um, okay, I want to clip my data to a particular block just because, okay, I wanna work with Martin East today. I don't care about Martin West. Um, these other ones where the data was collected are up in what we call the Taft block. I don't really want any of that stuff. I just wanna look at Martin East. So what we do is we copy the data. We'll copy this raw data to a new layer that clips it to the block. So up in the top, there's a copy data set button. So I hit that button. Um, it automatically names it copy of Cornell NDVI scan. Um, I wanna filter the data before copying. So the filter that I'm already seeing on the screen, that's what I wanna capture. So filter that data before copying and trim data using selected blocks. I think this is a really cool feature. That's why I'm highlighting it. If I just wanna look at a one particular block, I hit trim data using selected blocks. I say, oh, I just wanna deal with Martin East today because that's where we're gonna do our thinning or whatever we're gonna do. And I hit copy data set. So wait a second, it says data's copying and it'll appear when it's ready and boom, there it is. Copy of Cornell NDVI scan. And I click on that map. And now I just have just that data. Now it's been trimmed and it's been clipped to that block. So now I just have the data that I, I wanna work with for that day. And again, I can do some blocking of that. Uh, so say I wanted to separate that data naturally and into three zones, um, zone one, yeah, let's make that red. Zone two will make green. Zone three will make blue. So now we're trying to pick up what the pattern is in that vineyard. Again, we're getting a lot more reds down in this corner, some greens kind of in this area, and then a heavy blue area. So I'm kind of already leading you along. This vineyard's pretty streaky, even for being a one acre vineyard. Um, we're the and the streaks run diagonal. And it has to do with the way the soil is in that vineyard. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna stop with the importing of the sensor data at this moment. <laughs> We're gonna come back to this. Uh, okay, so that's just one scenario. Okay, you called up Jen, somebody comes out, scans your field, you wanna look at the NDVI in that field and here's, this is how you do it, right? You import that raw spatial data, you can uh, trim it, visualize it, color it whatever way you want, and then snap it to that block that you're very interested in. And now you're just dealing with the data in that block and you can, again, visualize it, um, break the data up in different ways to try to identify what the pattern is. Uh, another way to do this is to go out there and collect the data yourself that you, you as the person are the sensor, right? You're, 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 you are your own scouting tool whether that's vine size or bug infestation or whatever it is that you wanna collect spatial data on, you can do with what we call a data collector, which is this little clipboard thing down in the corner. It's called a data collector. But what I wanna do, if it'll work, is show you how you do this on your phone because all the features that are... Terry? Yes. I'm sorry, just there was a question in the chat box asking, can we get access to high resolution photos of vineyards through soil and water? Is it possible to use other geolocated images if we have access to them? 
or do you have to use a built-in imaging? Nope, uh, the answer is yes. So I'm assuming that those are coming in as raster images and that's, we would have to test that out. <laughs> we have a tool to do it and Nick can probably explain it. But over here in the plugins area are some of the advanced tools. And one of them is a, called a raster analysis. So I'm assuming the high res images that are coming in from uh, some other, you know, whether it's soil and water or a satellite image or a drone image, a lot of that data comes in as a raster image. And we have a raster analysis tool, which essentially, so that's a picture with data behind it. And the raster, and my EV works on point data. So my EV looks at the raster image and then collects the, or converts that geo TIFF image into point data and then projects it into my EV. So the answer is yes. The answer is if somebody goes out and does that today, they're probably gonna get a, a bug and it won't work, but they can send it to us and we can figure it out. <laughs> it's it's definitely on the uh, on the agenda. And also for your, if the question's referring to the base layer, because the satellite imagery can be, depending on where you are located, if you're in an urban area, obviously it's like more high res. Um, but if we, you wanted a different base layer, um, that's something that we could put on our roadmap and consider. I guess that was my question, Nick. That was mine. Um, just because with our with our mapping project, we we get access to not all the counties in the Finger Lakes, but a few of them invest you, in high res, very high res photos. Yeah. They're great. They're super. In, I mean, data intensive, obviously. But are they but, um, interactive? Can you like pinch in and zoom around and? Yeah. So I would be interested in just looking at that data because um, yeah. there might be an easy way for us if you're already paying for it. Um, there may be a way to easily put a small setting in your farm where you could override the base map with your own custom base layer. Um, so yeah, something to I, explore. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to the guys when I see them next time. I see um, Russell had asked on the no. text chat, um, if you could name the copy something other than copy underscore Cornell. Um, yes, you can name your copy files, whatever you like. Okay, uh, can you see the, this little the mini screen on the figure screen? Okay, so I'm actually projecting my phone to my computer right now. So this is exactly what I'm seeing on my phone. Uh, so everything, and so you just, again, when you open up my EV on your phone, it will, um, it'll guide you or instruct you to basically have the native app. You don't have to go out to the Google store or Apple store or whatever to, to download it. Is that right, Nick? <laughs> it'll just do it if you say, okay. That's, that's correct. Yeah. We're, we're using what's called a progressive web app, which basically means you can save the app to your phone without having to download it from the app store. Uh, okay. So all the same features that are on the desktop are on the phone. So let's see the, yep. Let me just remap that. Right. So whatever I can see on my desktop, I can see on my phone. Um, so if I want to go out and collect some other data on my phone, uh, I want to create a data collector. So I go to the uh, clipboard here in the corner. So I'm, I'm even getting texts while I'm trying to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, this data collector, there is also a tutorial on the My EV website walking you through it. So you don't have to hurry up and learn it right now. We can um, make this available to you later as well. Yeah. So again, the, the data collector is, is there for you to be able to go out and collect whatever data that you want. Um, I actually find this like hugely useful, um, almost more than the sensor data, and I'm a sensor guy. <laughs> uh, so a lot of times when we're working with sensor data, right, it's very, um, you get a lot of data, there's a lot of junk data that you have to trim out, and then when, you, when you're collecting data with a sensor, you're collecting an electromagnetic signal of some sort, right? It's not a direct observation or, or measurement of what you want, right? We use NDVI 
to essentially try to measure canopy fill. But it's just it's just a reflectance signal of that canopy uh, where we have to go, then go out in the field and kind of validate, yeah, okay, the low NDVI signal, the vines are sick. <laughs> They're like one pound vines. These ones are two pound vines. And then the ones where I'm getting a really high signal that yes, those are three pound vines. And, and that you know changes my management um, of that vineyard. When I'm out there collecting data, with the data collector and I as a viticulturist are observing something and making a, a call or making a measurement and observation in the field. I'm already kind of intuitively doing that. I'm standing in a field looking around going, okay, the vines in this area of the field are small. They're one pound vines. And so that's what I record on the data collector. Um, and, you know, and so on as I go through a stronger part of the vineyard. So I'm kind of making, already making that data collection and validation thing right on the fly. Um, the negative part about the data collector is that you're collecting information with your phone. The GPS is not awesome. It's good, it's not awesome. It's got some drift in it and you're, you know, you're not collecting data as, as um, data dense as you will with the sensor because you know, you're making observation and you're clicking it with your phone. Um, so what do I mean by that? Say I wanna set up a data collector. I hit the data collector button uh, and it asks me what I wanna collect. So let's say I wanna collect vine size. So that'd be something, you know, maybe you wanna go out and collect this time of year in the next couple of weeks. You know, before you start pruning, you know, go around some of your blocks and run up and down the rows on a gator or, or whatever, whenever you're doing out there um, and, and collect what you think is vine, good vine size uh, in that vineyard. Do I have one pound, two pound, three pound, or four pound vines? Probably all have really small vines after the big ass crop that we had this year. <laughs> um, and so it says add a field. So again, this is not a physical field, this is an attribute. So I'm adding an attribute um, and I'm gonna call it pruning weight. And now I have options, it can be a text, um, like I can actually write in <laughs> to number one, or I can uh, select or have a number range. For example, if I want to, if I'm going to measure vine size from zero to four pounds by half a pound increments, I can do that. And I add that field. And then um, when, whatever, when I go to collect that data, there's a slider there. So let me see if I can, if it'll let me do it. Okay, so I have a data collector called Vine Size. I click on that data collector. Um, if I were in the field, right? So if I hit this yellow button, that's my GPS button. I hit that and it tells me where I am. And yeah, guess what? <laughs> that's exactly where my office is, <laughs> where I'm talking to you from at Claro. It's putting me right here. Um, and say the vine I was looking at at that location was a one pound vine, I'd hit submit and the data would be collected. Now the idea is I walk up and down my vineyard rows, the GPS is following me and I'm putting in one pound, two pound, three pound, whatever it is and, and mapping that. Um, and so that's essentially how you use the data collector and then it, it will automatically go to my EV so that you can then map that data. So let's see. Oops. Get rid of this for now. Let's see if it actually did it. Okay. So I go back to my EV. I go to sit down at my desk. Or again, again, I could do this on my phone. Sit down at my desk and it's already there. So this um, what antenna little icon shows that it's a dynamic data set, meaning it's individual data points that were collected. And I could even edit those data points if I want to. So a data collector makes these dynamic data sets and it's already there in my EV and I click on it and it uploads that data. And it shows me that I was sitting in my office with a one pound vine. Um, but again, it's, you're supposed to do that in the field. So we did do that. So let me upload a data file that I collected with a data collector in the same field. So I go back here, 
I hit upload data. And this will be, let's call it bind size data collector. Choose the file. Okay, so this is a bind size rating that I did at 30 days after bloom because we wanted to use that information for our crop estimation. And I collected that data. Submit. Okay, so very similar to the NDVI data that was collected with the sensor, we collected, I went out and visually collected bind size information just with the, the data collector in the same blocks. And this is the Martin East block. Um, so again, I can, I don't have to do a lot of trimming or um, filtering of that data because I, you know, I was in the block when I collected the data and I like, I wasn't collecting data down farm roads. I was in the block and I shouldn't have a lot of junk data in there because I'm, I'm walking, making observation, collecting the data, walking, making an observation, collecting the data. There's the data in there is already pretty good. So again, I want to map that. Um, Terry, I'm yes. sorry, while you're mapping it, there's a question for you or Nick, and it says approximately how accurate is a phone GPS? Is it three feet? Is it six feet? We generally get um, in the one meter uh, accuracy range when we have an open sky or we're, when we're in cell phone range, especially. So that's less than three feet. So within arm's range is your general. Um, if it's a cloudy day, um, you have an, a dated phone maybe, there's reasons why it might be a little bit less. Um, and the, the app will show you exactly how accurate each point is while you're collecting. Thank you. Ah, okay, I was just gonna show that, let's see. <laughs> uh, um, Ah! Okay, wait a minute. Let me go back. Change my farm. Go to my farms. I'm going to go to the best farm ever. This again, this is on my phone. I go to my data collectors. I, this is the vine size data collector I made, right? And it's telling me my GPS that I'm sitting in my office here. And th this is what Nick was talking about. So your GPS accuracy is down to 3.8, is that meters? Yeah, 3.8 meters. Yeah. So but you're indoors. Yeah. So. Yes, I'm indoors. If I'm outside, it's going to be better. If it's really bad, it'll say bad. <laughs> or it's going to say okay, or it's going to say good. And usually when you're outside in the clear sky, it's going to be good. The data I collected, so when I did this at 30 days after bloom, I was outside on a clear sky and it's, you know, I my whatever, my GPS location is good, but you can see as I walked down a particular row, it drifted over to the next row and then back. So you're gonna get drift when you're using your cell phone GPS. And that has to do with, it has to do with a lot of things, but it has to do with the, mostly the number of satellites that your phone is seeing. The more satellites that are, the better it can triangulate and the better accuracy your, your location is going to be. So but, potentially you could buy a GPS antenna to add to your phone while you're walking around if this was the only sensor you were going to use? Uh, ooh. We yes. did test. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So was it Bad Elf? Did, was, was there success with that, Nick? I tested the um, Bad Elf has a small uh, unit that plugs into an iPhone. I got the same result um, with my phone oh. in both cases. I know they have higher end um, yes. Bluetooth so, GPS units that'll get you down to like yeah. very, very so accurate. The, the, the bad elf is a, it's a whatever, an external antenna and it's used by pilots, like um, recreational pilots to help with the accuracy of their GPS on their phone. Um, so when, when we look at, uh, go back to our NDVI scan. Now you, you'll you see that these ones don't drift very much, right? If I went down a row, it's pretty darn straight. It keeps us around the row. But we're using what we call a WAS corrected GPS. Um, so it's a more expensive GPS 
it's using not only satellites, but um, or whatever it's using, I don't know if it's Coast Guard antennas or whatever. It's using other means to lock in that location. So you can buy a higher end GPS antenna and lock in your, in your location. And if you really want to spend a lot of money, you get a RTK uh, system where you have another base station, a uh, unmovable base station, say in the corner of your farm. And then that really locks down the accuracy. And that's what they use when they're, um, was it the, like the Beckmans when they're doing the tile drainage and you need to get down to centimeter accuracy, you have to set up an RTK system. Thank you. I guess I would just add that for most of our vineyard management stuff, when you're just trying to identify the pattern in the vineyard, whether that be soil or canopy growth or anything, the accuracy of the GPS in your phone is, is good enough, I think. Okay. Uh, okay, so again, here's our, our vine size map of Martin East. I just wanna look at Martin East. I copy the data. I don't really need to filter it and I don't need to trim it because it's already done. And, uh, oh, I do want to snap it to the block. Trim using the selected blocks. And I click on the Martin East block. I copy the data set. And it's working on it. Okay. So we have a copy of the. Okay. So, so far that is working with raw data, visualizing the raw data whether it came from a sensor or whether you did a data collect. Is that good before I move on? Any questions? So basically the, basically the workflow is gather the data, take out all the bad stuff, copy it, and then yep. put it to the, lock it, lock it with the block that it belongs to. Yes. Got it. Okay, and now the next step in the workflow is to smooth the data, <laughs> or what we call interpolate the data. Yep. So, uh, Terry, I'm sorry, there's questions coming in the chat box as we're yep. going through. One says, can you adjust for drift? It deselected all of the north points. Yeah, um, so what we do have a tool where you can actually go in and adjust. Uh, I think right now we just have it set to adjust individual data points. Um, but eventually we'd like to add more tools to be able to select a whole, whole group of data points. Um, Terry, if you click on, if you close out of that drawer yeah. and go to your, yeah, right here. Um, yep. Go ahead and launch, launch that. This yeah, one? That, yep. Sure. Um, and then click on the little cog, the yellow cog up there under the title. So right here, you can actually, it's going to, open up the individual data points. So if you see that drift going on, you could go into each point and you could kind of yank them and pull them back to, um, oh. you know, inside the row. Yeah, like he's doing there. So eventually we intend on it so that you could select a whole group of points. We just haven't gotten around to that functionality yet. So this is how you could manually go in and adjust for drift if you could see it as an apparent um, thing. Oh, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm trying to think of a good way to explain data interpolation, or I guess a, a good way to say, call it, and I've heard it called this before, is data prediction. So if I want a continuous map of that, that vineyard block in terms of whatever, whatever it is, NDVI in this case, or vine size, um, I need to predict what I think the vine size is gonna be like in the row. So like if I collect the data on every third row or fifth row, um, so there are spatial data statistics ways of doing that. And there's, it's an actually an active area of research and experts in the area argue all the time over what's the best way to do it. <laughs> um, so we took the simplest, the quickest, uh, way that 
it takes like the least amount of processing power and we call it inverse distance weighted interpolation. And all of that means is that you're gonna take this data, you're gonna smooth it so that you can see the pattern that's in the field. So let's, um, let's see, let's first, let's do it on the NDVI. So we want the copy of the Cornell. Okay, so we'll start with this data. Copy Cornell NDVI scan, I have to remember that. Go to my plugins drawer and I hit the interpolator button. Then it's gonna ask me what layer I wanna interpolate and what it wants me to interpolate on. So we want the copy of the Cornell NDVI scan. We wanna interpolate it for NDVI because again, that's what we're looking at. And we hit interpolate. And this could take a little bit. So it, it's actually going through some pretty intensive data processing and that was pretty fast. The larger the data set, the longer it's gonna take. So, I mean, if you took a 500 acre block and you wanted to interpolate all the NDVI, it's gonna take a little while. And so you can either download the data set or you can add it to my EV. So you just hit add it to my EV. Just for a quick question, what would be, why would you want both of those buttons? Like you wanna download it cause you're gonna send it to somebody? Yes. Oh, yep. Yeah. Store it. <laughs> Got it. So, like, you know, say you're, you're done working for the day and you just want it in a folder on your computer and then you want to pull it in later. Okay. Thank you. It had a pop-up that was just there yeah. that said that it was done. So okay. if you close there, yep. We'll go back. Let's go to my, okay. So now it says interpolated and the name of my file, which was copy Cornell and DVI scan, which again, we can name it whatever we want. And I click on that button. So now what it did was there, Nick has invisibly, <laughs> Nick has placed over like the whatever, the whole part of the earth that we would work with, a fishnet grid um, that is, is it eight by eight, Nick? It's uh, the, it's actually the entire planet. Um, and it's uh, the, uh, it's three meters. I believe it's a three meter grid by default in the advanced okay, settings. Nine, you nine can by see. nine. So yeah, we roughly nine nine. want a grid that's, you know, roughly about our vine spacing. Um, so every point's going to be um, in that, whatever. No, it's more, more than the vine spacing. Three by three meter. Yeah, it's nine feet by nine feet. So roughly every point's roughly a vine. Okay. So again, we want to go by NDVI. We're going to do a Jenks three zones. Ah, never likes my colors. So zone one will go red. Zone two will go green. Zone three will go blue. There we go. So now I'm starting to see the pattern that's in that field. Getting more tech. Um, okay, so now we've taken our NDVI, our raw data, we've cleaned it, we've clipped it to the block. Um, it's still raw data that still, it can be kind of noisy. So the data interpolation, what it does is, you know, every single point that you see on that map is now influenced by the points that are around it, right? So if you have, um, if you have a point that is say a weak vine or a dead vine, but it's right in the middle of a bunch of strong vines, it's gonna bring that up. It's gonna interpolate or predict that what should be in that spot is a strong vine, even if it's missing one. So it's, it's smoothing out some of the erroneous data or maybe um, not the, you know, the data that's going against the trend and it's smoothing it so that now you can see the underlying pattern, right? So in the red area, yeah, there may be small vines, medium vines and big vines, but there are a lot more small vines. So I'm in that general area. I know that that part of the vineyard is weak. Green, you know, there's more medium sized vines. And in the blue area, there may be some missing vines or small vines in there, but in general, those vines are bigger. 
And so it's, you know, it's smoothing that data and it's showing me that pattern because now if I want to say do variable rate fertilizer or variable rate thinning or variable rate pruning in that vineyard, I'm probably going to base it on, you know, that pattern that's in the, the vineyard, not necessarily, you know, um, we're not down to like individual vine pruning, like with a robot, although that's probably coming. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that's data interpolation. Um, we can do the same thing. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? I know it's a lot of information being thrown at you. Can I um, uh, make a suggestion real quick, Terry? Yeah. If you click on that little, the feedback horn right there, that button, there's this, this, link that says watch these videos yep. we're keeping this one page up to date with uh every tutorial video that we come out with so as we add new features as we make adjustments and these are very short videos so i think right now there's maybe 20 minutes of content or 25 minutes half an hour of content something like that on this entire page so basically everything that you're going over today you can um it's all there it's all here yeah Thank you. Yep. Well, then I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Let's run through this real quick, see if it works. We'll do an interpolator. Let's interpolate my vine copy of my vine size data collector. Um, we'll do it based on the rating. So if you're going to interpolate data, it needs to be number data. So if I go and I do vine size and it's, I rate it as small, medium, and large, it can't interpolate words. It has to interpolate numbers. So they're rated one, two, or three. Um, and so I'll just interpolate that. It's added it. Again, value based on the rating. Let's go Jenks, three zones. One is so just, red. Just one for clarification, green. if you want to see zones, it should always be Jenks. No, not necessarily. <laughs> it could be equal interval. Okay. So it, again, it's what it's doing is it's taking the bell-shaped curve and if it's equal interval, it's splitting the bell-shaped curve into equal intervals. With Jenks, it, it goes by natural breaks, which is it's looking at standard deviations in the data, okay. not just you know in quartiles. It's it's just the way it's breaking it up. And you know, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> it's it, I think personally, again, as a bit of culturist, I want to break up that data and look at it and be like, okay, does that make sense to me in the vineyard? Like okay well let's oh, let's this is a good example let's look at this um all right so i went out with my eye and that's the pattern it gave me and let me pull back that let's go there's let's also an Another question while you're flipping through there. It says, how do we determine vine size so we're all consistent? <laughs> you measure it, of course. I was going to um, say green weights. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, this is a good example. If I go out with an NDVI sensor and I scan a vineyard, I have to go out in the vineyard and, and either make observations or make measurements to validate that sensor data, right? What's an NDVI of 0.5? I don't know. Is that a one pound vine, a two pound vine, or a three pound vine? I have to go out to the vineyard where there's a 0.5 and make an assessment. You could say the same thing about your, um, about your eye. Is it calibrated? And sometimes I say to people, be honest. <laughs> Do you know what a one pound vine looks like? 
You know what a two pound buy-in looks like. You know what a three pound buy-in, I keep getting texts. Um, <laughs> uh, and you, even the most experienced of you that are out there, I was gonna say the most experienced of us, cause you know, I find that I'm not very experienced. I go out, I think, I think I'm looking at a two pound vine and I actually measure it and it's like a half a pound vine or, you know, something I think is a four pound vine and ends up being a two pound vine. I mean, I think we've, over the years, we've lost our calibration in our eye to what the pruning weight is. So it's good to go out. Stan Howell at Michigan State used to make his students go out, guess pruning weight and then prune the vine and make way the prunings and try to calibrate their eye. So you don't have to take pruning weight on every vine in the vineyard, but you, you need to know what you're looking at and then be able to assess it appropriately. That makes sense. Um, okay, so we've made two maps. One was based on NDVI, which is the one that's on my cell phone, uh, my EV. And then there's the one, my desktop, my EV is the one that I did with my eye. So yeah, they're not the same. They're similar, but they're not the same. Uh, the NDVI just said, well, they're really weak in the corner. And then these ones are okay. And these ones are strong. I, with my eye, I was saying, yeah, there's a streak that's running through there. That's pretty weak. And so I was rating those lower than the actual NDVI was. So I don't know which one's right. Which one am I more comfortable with? <laughs> um, and that's, you know, that's the part of being an engaged manager of saying, yep, I think I believe the one on the right more than the one on the left, maybe. And then we use um, the map on the left, actually, this NDVI map. So what do you use that for? What we did is, so we go out and we do what we call a stratified random sampling, meaning we took samples in the red, we took samples in the green area, we took samples in the blue area at crop estimation time. Within the red, the location was random. So that's why we call it a stratified random. We stratified samples across the three colors, but within a color, it was just random. It's like, I don't have any data to tell me where to really take it. So I take it randomly. So say I took three random samples in the red, three random samples in the green, three random samples in the blue. I found out that we had 13 tons per acre in the blue, 10 tons per acre in the green, and eight tons per acre in the red. And we had to make a decision on how we wanted to thin that. We said, well, the big vines can ha handle a big crop, so we did very little thinning in there. The red vines were very weak, and an eight ton per acre crop was too much for those vines to handle. So we, we actually took those down to like four tons per acre. Um, and so we did variable rate thinning across that block. So really there was two uses. One was let's do the stratified random sampling to come up with a better crop estimate. And we, we did. And then based on that, we made a crop load management decision and did variable rate thinning on top of it. So that is the kind of thing that we're actually using the data for. Terry, based on that, could you also potentially have a um, revenue map? Yep, so we've done that. Uh, we've done that before. I haven't done it in a couple of years, but you know, if I know, um, I know what the tonnage. So, okay, so we also have yield monitors <laughs> on our harvesters. So when I pick that block, I know what the yield is going across the block. Um, we have a BRICS monitor that we're still working on improving, but we, we're, we're working with one, a BRICS monitor. So if I know what the yield and the BRICS are and I know what the payment scale is, I can come up with, uh, this is what I got paid for those grapes spatially across the block. And I can say, oh, I was, based on the inputs that I had for that year, I can say, yep, I made money in the blue and I lost money in the red, essentially. Okay, any other questions? I, I think that's all I really wanted to show you. There's more stuff we can do now that data is interpolated. For example, if I wanna compare the map on the right and map on the left, like how similar are they? Well, now that I've interpolated the data to a common grid, well, now I can export all that data to an Excel sheet and match it all up and I can look at correlations. I mean, I could do a lot more science-y stuff. 
um, to, to do multi-layer analysis and data mining and all this wonderful stuff people talk about. I think for right now, I think it's just, I think we should stop here. I want people to play with setting up their farm, establishing their farm blocks, maybe going out and collecting some data, um, just playing with it, trying to break it, trying to come up with bugs. Um, I have, there's one thing. So some of you I know are hunters. <laughs> So I have a map. This is something I just did for fun. So I have this farm. Okay, so this is the this is the land that my son and I go hunting on. This forested piece right here, and I've got I've gone out and collected data. So if you're a deer hunter and you want to go out and you're scouting where deer are, or maybe like where rubs are, you can set up a data collector to say, you know, when I'm walking through the forest, where do I see deer rubs? Um, I think I've got a layer in here where it's like where we've harvested deer from. So over the past like four years, you know, I can look at this, you know, Ted Taft, he got a deer down here. I got one up here. My son got one over here, like over the last couple of years. So we get an idea of where the deer are going. I think I have a layer um, that shows where one of the deer trails are. So I was just walking through the forest where the deer trail was. So I know the deer run through here and that's where I set up a tree stand. I mean, just that's more fun stuff. It's not, <laughs> it's not necessarily uh, vineyard related, but if you wanna use it, play with it, try to break it and come up with um, things that you wanna see, then give us your feedback in the feedback button. Cherry. Yeah, there is a question in the chat box that says, can we use, say, mid-year mapping from any GPS map to compare vine size to actual crop harvested, say, this year? Do you mean, um, it's from Stephen, right? Stephen, do you, do you mean, like, take an NDVI map and then compare it to your yield map if you had an ag leader growing? Oops. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yep. That would just maybe add a little more accuracy to what you're... Absolutely. Um, so we are definitely... Okay. I have, yeah. <laughs> we have another hour-long talk on this. Uh, <laughs> so we have, okay, I'm just trying to remember where I have the data. So the railroad block. So we have the six-acre Concord block up here. We collect a lot. We've been collecting any spatial data that we can collect since, since I think, 2014. Like we have 170 different data layers in for that block um, that Rianne actually compiles for me and puts in one big data file that I can import into my EV and, and look through. Um, and this is just a small portion of that data set. So again, we take all that data, we interpolate it. So we, we predict the data to a common grid in that, that R block. So I can cycle through all the different NDVIs, if we collected NDVI weekly throughout the season, I can look through all of those. Um, and then I can compare those data, data layers, like here's a, a BRICS map of that same field. Um, I don't have this year's yield data on there, but I think I have last year's yield data. BRICS monitor, BRICS monitor, ag leader yield data. That was the yield map from last year. So a couple of things that we're working on or discovering is, so now you look at multi-layer data analysis. We tend to find that the NDVI in Concord, the NDVI around bloom, say in the two weeks pre, two weeks post bloom, if we get some NDVI readings there, that tends to correlate best with yield. It's not a perfect correlation. You know, it's not one-to-one, -one, it's I don't know, probably like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, which is pretty good when you're looking at that number of data points. The NDVI around variation tends to relate best with pruning weight. So we can start making crop load maps. If I have a validated NDVI map at Bloom, I have a validated NDVI map at variation. And if crop load is the yield, the pruning weight ratio, I can now actually make another, mathematically make another map, which is crop load. I think we even have that. Here's crop load from last year. 
Um, so, I mean, we'd have to calibrate what this is, but I mean, you could say the, the red vines are overcropped, the yellow vines are balanced and the green vines are undercropped, you know? And then that's gonna affect how the fruit or how the vines make sugar this year. And it's gonna affect what the return crop is next year. So I can start doing these multi-layer data investigations to see where they are. Another good example is if I want to, I want to do, I want to have a very good crop prediction map. We're finding like, well, I know last year's crop load is going to affect this year's yield. Okay, so I want that map in there. And then this year's NDVI um, at Bloom is going to, has a good relationship with yield. So I want that layer in there. And then say uh, my soils layer is really impacting vine size. So I want that. And I take those three day layers and I start to do some modeling on it. I can actually generate a map mid season that has a really high correlation with the actual yield map is. So those, those are areas of research that are active and ongoing. I don't know if I have that. Beautiful. In my presentation. Gary, there's another question as well from Hans in the chat box. Is there a tool to direct where to collect samples within a block? Oh, you're asking all the advanced questions. <laughs> Can you do it within different zones like you were talking about earlier? Yes. So, okay. So, okay. Say I want to take the 2020 crop load um, and I want to sample against that for next year's yield, whatever. And we want to do the stratified random sampling, right? I want to take so many samples in the red, the yellow, and the green, but within a zone, I want it to be random. I can take this map, and I go over to this little plugins, and I hit grid generator, and click on the blocks. So you're, you're putting me on the spot here. So I want that. Um, That's why I came. Yeah, use a data set. I want railroad block. I want. Just winging it here now. Yeah. Say I want, let's just say I want to do it by this year's BRICS map. Gratified. I want five points per zone. Generate my grid. Okay. So. It's done it. <laughs> um, I have to work with this a little bit. But what it's doing is the red dots are where now where it's telling you you should sample. So it's saying it took that data, it broke it up into three zones, and then it gave me five random locations within each of those zones. Now I can go out to that location in the field and make, um, make my measurement there. And then it, we can then use that to translate the big spatial map with the data we just collected in the field. We are getting way beyond where we should be talking today. <laughs> Welcome back. But right? would, I so want you to build your farm, put on the blocks, and maybe collect some data with the data collector and map it and try to work with that and get used to it. Then we can get into data translation, multi-layer analysis, prediction, that we can do that in a, a tutorial way down the road. Right. Especially after I've figured it all out. <laughs> and we've worked out all the bugs. Yeah. I would like to ask, like, before we end and sign off, if everyone who is in attendance here who is not on the team could put something in the chat box in regards to whether you think you would use it, if you wouldn't use it, why not? Was there a hang up? what you could use it for. I would just like a little bit of feedback on if you're interested in it and the ease of use. And any dream features too, if you've ever wanted to just map something on your farm or use your phone. Um, yeah, if you could wave a wand and have any kind of feature with this stuff, with spatial data collection, um, we're interested in knowing what that is. So I was talking with the team a little bit in regards to having already some pre-made data collectors out there, things that people would be interested in when not having to set up like a vine size or um, disease pressure slider one to five. So anything that you could think of that you would like to use it for. Yeah, so there's we, this feature. So if I go to a data collector 
and whatever, I'm collecting berry moth. I can, once I make that data collector, Nick has put in this export settings. So then it can be exported and then you can send it out to growers so that there's like a pre, you know, it's like, oh, here's the data collector you use when you're scouting for berry moth or for spotted lantern fly or whatever. Maybe we could put together a page at some point with like a catalog of pre-built collectors. And then you could go in there and download te these templates. Would that be useful to people here on the call? I think it would be useful for the beginners who want to get out and use it. Oh, soil map overlay template. Nice, Debbie. Yeah, we, we've tried to get our hands on the, uh, the raw soil um, survey data. It's a lot harder than we thought it would be to get, but um, it's on the roadmap to try to get that loaded in. I would like, personally, I would love to pull in uh, sort of out, outside data sources and put those at your fingertips. I would love to give you access to weather. I'd love to give you access to soils. Um, so we're, we're definitely exploring those external data sources that can help. Um, I see um, Hans mentioning uh, map leaf roll virus. That to me sounds like, like any of these pests um, are kind of sort of what Terry was mentioning with mapping his um, hunting lot. Um, one of the examples we use a lot is the sort of broken post. So if you're just looking for something to collect data about, we always say that the broken post is an easy data set to create. Go out and use your phone to map all of the broken posts. Um, same thing with any of these pests that you discover in the field. Especially over time uh, with, with something like leaf roll, which is a, you know, not something that just kind of appears one year because it's wet or dry or whatever, and then disappears. It's, it's a progression over, over time. And so having, um, I mean, I can obviously do it with individual fields now, but like you were talking before, Nick, about having some kind of logging, multiple year logging or something like that um, could be really helpful with that particular example. I was just looking for my potassium map. So here's one that we made um, right before harvest. So a lot of you saw potassium deficiency roll in late into the vineyards. And so this was, I set up a data collector to go rate potassium deficiency in this vineyard. And, and really I, I got on a gator, drove up and down the rows and rated uh, potassium deficiency, I don't know, what was on a one to three or one to four rating and, and got this map that ended up looking like the BRICS map um, where I had heavier potassium deficiency, the BRICS were lower. And that, again, that informed us on how we were going to harvest that block. Um, wow. We actually went to pick that block and the, the areas with higher potassium deficiency had lower BRICS. And we wanted, <laughs> we tried to do like everybody else, kind of pick it all together and blend it, but it wasn't making, it wasn't making the whatever, 14, nine standard. So we ended up picking part of the field with higher sugar and had to wait a week to pick the other part to get it all in. Do you purposely use black as your low potassium? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the way I colored it. <laughs> Terry, this, this map was using collectors. Yep, is yep. You interpolated it. Wow. Use use it. it yep. And uh, yeah, I think I went I on a gator up and down every other row and essentially just kept. I was driving. <laughs> it's fun. I would suggest having something to mount your your phone to when you're doing it because I was holding on with my hand trying to drive and I was entering data as fast as I could. So as I was driving, I'd look, I'd rate, I'd hit the button, and just keep going. Um, and then interpolated that data. So, Russell said it seems it would be useful to target spraying honey vine slippery milkweed. Um, exactly. Go out when it's really big in the fall and then hit it with pre emergent in the spring by following your the map you made. Yeah. Uh, we've talked, uh, 
oh, who was it? The um, Rob at or Mark Mark Amadon, I think, keeps asking me at, at National about could you variable rate spray suckers based on an NDVI? So if you had a good NDVI map and you knew where the vines were strong, so you don't need, really need any suckers there, so you would spray them. And then areas of the vineyard where it was weak, it would actually shut off the sucker sprayer because you want to keep those suckers to replace those vines. And I think that's an awesome idea and we just haven't done it yet. <laughs> it should be a very easy thing to do. Clear as mud for everybody. <laughs> Again, very simple. Establish your farm, put on the blocks, and then try to enter some data into the, the blocks and play with the way the data looks. So Terry, for the, our next one on the 30th, I believe it's the 30th, sorry, I don't have the it right in front of me. Yep. Um, are we anticipating having everybody go out and play with it and then come back with their questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I don't think I'm really going to prepare much for the next one. I mean, I, we can talk to it about some of the more advanced features, but I would rather have people play with it, you know, have questions or be like, I tried using it. I, I couldn't even get my farm made <laughs> and right. then help them walk, walk through getting it done. If I could put just one more emphasis on that, that bullhorn, um, because that's going to send me a message directly, that feedback button. If you, and it's going to, whatever email address you use to create your My EV account, um, that's going to give that to me. So if you have problems, um, this is the spot to ask questions and, and uh, we can get, get things fixed for you. And those really are helpful because we're coming from this from like the research standpoint, really want to know what the user standpoint is of it. So we have the jargon, we know what we're talking about, but sometimes it might confuse someone on the other end. So if you could just be as transparent as possible, <laughs> let us know what are you guys talking about? We appreciate that. <laughs> I know what it feels like when I ask my kids a question about my phone and they just like, just give me the phone. I'll do it for you. And I'm like, no, no, no. You need to teach me how to do it. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess we, if there aren't yeah, any more questions. I think we've, we've worn everybody out. Thank you all for joining us and please reach out with any questions. Thank you. Please, play, please play with it. Send us your feedback and, and just come ready with questions on the 30th. We'll do this again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Jen. No, thanks, everybody. I'll